lending support to people who have rheumatic disorders who are members of our community. Many of you have these disorders. I know I've talked to some of you about your situations and there are very complicated diagnostic and treatment issues and depending upon where you live in the country, uh, there are people who have extremely challenging experiences in finding uh, physicians who will provide them with the right diagnosis and who start them on a, a, a good treatment program. And Julius has been really amazing in reaching out to people and offering his help and his guidance in that process. And we're just very grateful to have him involved. So thank you, Julius. So um, the title of this presentation is uh, Neurological Manifestations of Lupus and Other Rheumatological Disorders. And I just want to start by giving a definition of what the rheumatic disorders are. So the rheumatic disorders are basically systemic autoimmune disorders. And by systemic, I mean autoimmune disorders that can affect really any part of the body, the skin, the heart, the lungs, and they could be very devastating syndromes. And the, neuro, the nervous system can be affected in the context of systemic inflammation. Um, so the clinic that I'm involved with at Hopkins is involved in taking care and thinking about mechanisms and why patients uh, with rheumatic disorders can develop specific uh, neurological manifestations. So, the goals of this uh, talk is uh, threefold. Um, the first is I just want to start by really introducing what are some of the systemic manifestations of the rheumatic disorders. And then I just want to go over a basic diagnostic paradigm for how we think about the neurological uh, syndromes which can occur in the rheumatic disorders. And then the last part is I want to introduce issues about diagnosis and treatment that are likely to be especially salient to the uh, transverse uh, myelitis uh, community. And within 30 minutes, it's not going to be possible to exhaustively cover all of the rheumatic syndrome. So I think I just want to topically focus on things that I think will be interesting to patients here. And then if there's a given rheumatic syndrome or a question that I don't cover, feel free um, to talk to me afterwards. So I'm going to start by talking about systemic lupus erythematosus. I'm going to refer to it either as SLE or lupus. So the American College of Rheumatology says that in order to be considered as having lupus, you need to have at least four of the following 11 criteria. The first criteria, one or two, are deal with rashes. The malar rash is this butterfly rash that a lot of patients with lupus can get. Um, number three, photosensitivity, refers to the attribute that in sunlight the rash tends to get a lot worse. Um, oral ulcers, um, arthritis, and by arthritis we don't only mean joint pain, but we mean swelling, warmth, and, and, and joints. Serositis refers to inflammation of the lining around the lung or the heart. Um, you can see kidney disease. Um, the neurological features, which I'll go through. Hematological disorders, meaning that patients could have abnormalities of white blood cell counts, anemia. And then the last two refer to specific um, antibodies, which you see um, in lupus. And this raises the next question. Some pearls and myths about the diagnosis of lupus. So number one. My doc, and we hear this all the time. Well, my doctor says that I have lupus because I have a positive blood test, a positive ANA. And the first point I want to make, the pearl, is that there are no blood tests, which are not only diagnostic of lupus, but there are no blood tests which are actually diagnostic of any rheumatic disease. And any blood test needs to be taken in the context of whether there are accompanying signs or symptoms. Now the second thing is, well, in this slide right here, I said that the American College of Rheumatology says that you need to have four of the 11 criteria. Go, I'll figure this out. 
And the doctor says, well, I don't have lupus because I only have three of the 11 criteria. The thing that I want to emphasize is this is classification criteria. They are not diagnostic criteria. And the difference is classification criteria are devised for research purposes. So if someone comes in with a positive anti-double-strand DNA antibody and they have renal disease, they have two of the classification criteria, but for the point of diagnosis and how I'm going to take care of them in the clinic, they have lupus. So it's, not, it's important for physicians not to be prisoners of these classification criteria, which are actually artifactual. Now, when we talk about the neurological manifestations of lupus, it's important to realize that up to about three quarters of the neurological disease that you see in lupus is not actually going to be due to lupus. So it's going to be due often to a related, although unrecognized, coincidental autoimmune disorder. Um, very often, it's a complication of treatment, such as uh, prednisone. So the first step in the da diagnostic paradigm is really to try to figure out, both from the point of the patient and the physician, am I dealing with a neurological complication of lupus, or am I dealing with something else, a mimicker? So I'm going to present, these are two examples of headaches in patients with lupus. So the uh, first uh, patient is a uh, MD-PhD student at Hopkins. And uh, she had lupus, and she came in saying, I have a very uh, mild headache. She was having difficulty pipetting and completing uh, experiments in the lab. And her doctors assumed, well, headache and lupus, so she has a neurological complication of lupus. I think she needs a very potent immunosuppressant agent, such as cytoxan. And um, let me see. Oh. Is there a... Uh, I just want to point out something here. Just give me one second, because I want to try to point out the MRI in terms of a... Uh, Is that not a pointer? I don't know my glasses are. Oh, this one right here. Oh, here we go. Thanks. So first of all, what you see here is that the holes which drain the uh, fluid in the brain are called the ventricles. And these are enlarged, and it's called hydrocephalus. And the reason she has hydrocephalus is because she has a narrowing, basically, in the plumbing, which drains the water out of the brain. And this is not due to lupus. She was born with this. And this is an example of, some, of a patient with aqueductal stenosis. And she did very well with surgery and actually did not require any immunosuppressant treatment. This is a different case. And this is a 45-year-old woman with very severe lupus who was actually treated with cytox cytoxin and sulcept. And she developed this MRI. And you see here, you see this involved um, gray matter or the area of the brain uh, deep and as well as the, uh, the white matter. And uh, she had these uh, brain lesions biopsied. And unfortunately, she was found to have lymphoma, which is a, a type of cancer. So this illustrates that there are, this is the first step that you have to think about. What are causes of headaches that are not due to lupus? Because they have different treatments. And then once you rule out infections and cancers, then you could start thinking, well, what are causes of headaches that are actually due to lupus? And just as an example, lupus patients can develop a, a septic meningitis, which is a meningitis which is not due to infection. They could get blood clots in the uh, veins of the brain, otherwise called a sagittal sinus thrombosis. And it's due to a clotting disorder called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now, lupus patients can get strokes as a result of their lupus. But again, you always have to rule out causes, which could be causes of strokes in the general population, such as diabetes and high cholesterol. And lastly, they could develop vasculitis, which is a syndrome of inflammation of blood vessels. So the same approach 
how we think about all the neurological syndromes needs to be brought on when we think about how we think about myelitis and lupus patients. And really, for much of the past century, when we had a lupus patient with myelitis, we would say lupus plus myelitis. It has to be because of the lupus. And this case kind of subverts this. So this is a 45-year-old African-American female. And she has a history of lupus. She has the positive autoantibodies, malar rash and nasal ulcers. So her symptoms were actually very well controlled on Plaquenil. And in fact, after 1983, she never ever developed any symptoms of active lupus. But in 1986, she developed right optic neuritis, inflammation of the nerve uh, connecting the eye to the brain. And then from 1989 to 2006, she developed 12 attacks of myelitis. And she received the diagnosis of lupus myelitis, and she was treated with prednisone and imuran and cytoxan. And she didn't do well, and she uh, rapidly uh, uh, deteriorated and needed to be in a wheelchair and ultimately in a nursing home. And the questions that both her neurologist and rheumatologist had for these 17 years is why do I have a lupus patient with very well-controlled lupus symptoms, but she has such aggressive spinal cord disease? And um, this is uh, her MRI, and you see this white area of the inflammation of a swollen cord. And uh, this is her uh, MRI. And basically what you see, whitish area of inflammation really extending down the entire part of the spinal cord. And this is what we call longitudinally extensive myelitis, or myelitis which extends more than three of the bones. And the reason why she had such aggressive spinal cord disease when her lupus was so inactive is that the spinal cord disease was not due to lupus. And you've heard this uh, syndrome already. It was due to uh, Devic syndrome or NMO. So again, just you've heard talks about NMO, but I just want to emphasize that although optic neuritis and myelitis can occur in multiple sclerosis or lupus, we always need to be concerned about the possibility of a related autoimmune disease. And in all these lupus patients, it's mandatory to check for this NMO IgG antibody and to think about the spinal cord. Does it have evidence of this longitudinally extensive lesions? So again, lupus patients with optic neuritis and myelitis, they could have aggressive neurological disease because of a related autoimmune disorder. Now, the thinking has changed in the past, really, five years, almost so that a lot of researchers would say, well, now almost all spinal cord disease in lupus patients is due to neuromyelitis optica. And this uh, next case kind of challenges that assumption. So this is case two. So this is a 20-year-old Caucasian female, and she has a two-year history of lupus, blood test, and signs and symptoms. And in contrast to the first case, she had escalating and very robust lupus. So from August through September of 2006, her lupus was extremely active. She had worsening arthritis. She had pleuritic chest pain, which is chest pain with increases with inspiration. She had pericardial effusion, which is a inflammation and fluid accumulating around the heart, fever. So September 12, 2006, she was seen in the emergency room, and she was unable to avoid. She actually had 850, 850 cubic centimeters of urine in her bladder. And unfortunately, because of the presence of fever, she was sent home with a uh, urinary tract infection. So September 13, 2006, she woke up at 8 AM, and she took a shower, and she didn't quite feel well. She felt dizzy. She went back to bed. And then one half hour later, she woke up from a nap, and she tried to stand. And she fell to the floor, and she was unable to move. And she crawled to the telephone and, and called an ambulance. And one half hour in the ER, 30 minutes later, she was found to be completely paraplegic or unable to move her legs. She has this rising sensory cord level over two hours. Her lumbar puncture shows really a profile which is similar to that which you would see in a bacterial meningitis. Very, very high white cells. 
very high total proteins and low glucose, but she didn't have any signs of infection. She didn't have neck stiffness, so no signs of meningitis. And her MRI was interpreted as consistent with lupus myelitis, and she was treated with very um, intensive immunosuppressant treatment, prednisone and plasmapheresis and cytoxin. And uh, unfortunately, a year later, she was still in a wheelchair, and and she didn't have any improvement. So this case is really different from the first case because it occurred in the context of very, very active lupus disease. And the two distinguishing features are, number one, this hyperacute evolution. She was paraplegic in one hour. And the second thing that was interesting is, in contrast to uh, transverse myelitis, which in most cases is characterized by spasticity and increased reflexes. She had what we call lower motor neuron symptoms. So she had no reflexes. She actually had decreased tone. And um, so this is uh, her MRI, and it's a little bit more subtle, but you see in this area of inflammation in the central part of the cord. And she has some inflammation, mainly also in the central part of the cord. So what we're calling the subtype is distinguished from the first subtype of NMO-like. This is catastrophic myelitis. And it's catastrophic because of the following features, because of its acuity, how quickly it comes on, because of its severity, because of its irreversibility, and because of its intractability to treatment. And unlike case one, which was a myelitis and a lupus patient, but because of the autoimmune syndrome of NMO, this is exactly the type of myelitis in lupus patients, which is actually due to underlying lupus disease. So I just want to contrast again these two distinguishing subtypes and what we call catastrophic myelitis and incomplete myelitis. So incomplete myelitis, we're terming this because there is some preserved motor function, at least at the time of initial attacks. In contrast, catastrophic myelitis is complete paralysis at, at time of the index attack. The initial exam findings in incomplete myelitis are spasticity and hyperreflexia. In catastrophic myelitis, you see the exact opposite pattern. There's no spasticity and no reflexes. And again, incomplete myelitis, it tends to occur when the lupus disease is totally inactive, suggesting that it's due to another autoimmune disease. But catastrophic myelitis tends to occur with clinically active lupus. The incomplete myelitis is polyphasic, and we saw in the first case, this woman had 12 attacks. The catastrophic myelitis tends to be monophasic and occurs one time. So the summary of neurological manifestations of lupus is that the diagnosis of lupus is critically dependent not only on blood tests, but also on the life experience and the history of the patient and there is no diagnostic blood test. In every syndrome of lupus, be it headaches or myelitis, it's really crucial to determine whether the underlying neurological complication is due to lupus or whether there lurks another diagnostic explanation, be it an infection, a malignancy, or another autoimmune disease. And what we're seeing right now is really that the myelitis and lupus patients really falls into these two distinct syndromes, and they both require different diagnostic and uh, treatment strategies. These are some other neurological syndromes which could be seen in patients with lupus, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but they require the same diagnostic paradigm, movement disorders, strokes, psychosis, cognitive impairment, and peripheral neuropathies. So I'm going to talk now about <clears throat> Sjogren's syndrome. So uh, Sjogren's syndrome is an autoimmune disease, and the most common manifestation is what we call glandular manifestations. It causes dry eyes and dry mouth. But it's less recognized that systemic Sjogren's syndrome could cause an enormous amount of morbidity and it could affect not only the uh, nervous system, but the lungs as well as the kidneys.
And again, as for all of these rheumatic disease, the primary thing is the diagnosis, the symptoms, and blood tests should only be confirmatory. These are only a secondary part of the diagnostic process. So in terms of pursuing the diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome, you absolutely need to have symptoms of dry eyes and dry mouth, but you at least need to have at least one of the two following objective evidence, what we call confirmatory objective evidence. So the first is the presence of either one of these autoantibodies, and these are called SSA or anti-Rho, or SSB and anti la But you also, if these are negative, you need to get a lip biopsy. The lip biopsy shows inflammation in the salivary glands. And just as I did for lupus, I just want to talk about kind of myths and pearls about the diagnosis of, of Sjogren syndrome, who definitely have dry eyes and dry mouth. So the first myth is, we see this all the time, well, my doctor says I don't have Sjogren syndrome because I, ne I tested negative for the Sjogren's blood test. And again, just as there's no blood test for lupus, there is no Sjogren's blood test. The autoantibodies for Sjogren syndrome, SSA or anti rho are actually going to be negative in 50% of patients with Sjogren syndrome. So it's absolutely imperative when patients with myelitis are screened for second rheumatic disease, if you have dry eyes and dry mouth, and there's no other explanation, that your doctors should not stop at the finding of a negative blood test. If the blood test is negative and you have unexplained dry eyes or dry mouth, you absolutely need to pursue the diagnosis ruthlessly by obtaining a lip biopsy. Let's see if I get this too. So in terms of the neurological manifestations of Sjogren syndrome, the myelitis and the myelopathies, there's a transverse myelitis which is similar to patients with what we call idiopathic TM. A patient with Sjogren syndrome can have the concomitant syndrome of neuromyelitis optica. And patients with Sjogren syndrome can also, also present with a slowly worsening myelopathy which could sometimes be difficult to distinguish from primary progressive multiple sclerosis. But even more than lupus, Sjogren syndrome um, can present with a bedeviling array of uh, neuropathies. So there's different types of uh, neuropathies. There's neuropathies, and neuropathy is, again, inflammation and damage to the nerves outside the spinal column. It could present with weakness, and you'll see this usually on nerve conduction tests, but they could present with excruciating, lancinating, burning pain. And this is what we call a small fiber neuropathy. And we call this a small fiber neuropathy because these nerve fibers really can't be tested on routine nerve conduction tests. And again, this is a common scenario that we see. We see patients with Sjogren syndrome coming in with nerve pain, and they say, well, my doctor says I, doesn't, I don't have a neuropathy because my nerve conduction tests are normal. And again, we have to remember that all these tests are corollary and that they really do uh, sometimes require special diagnostic techniques. Third, the uh, neuropathy of Sjogren syndrome can present with a combination of pain and weakness. So this is an example of the diagnostic technique very often, which is required to document small fiber neuropathy in Sjogren syndrome when there are normal nerve conduction tests. And this is a skin biopsy. So really what you see on the left is a skin biopsy of a normal patient. And you, what you're looking at is the ramifying network of nerves which are coursing through the skin. And here you see a nice, robust, ramifying network. And this is a patient on the right who had excruciating pain and was told by her referring neurologist that she didn't have a neuropathy. And what you see if you compare it in both the proximal or the upper, as well as the skin of the leg, you see complete dropout of these nerves. And this really underscores a distinguishing mechanism which causes a neuropathy in Sjogren's patients. So the last point that I want to make is it's really imperative that as up 
to 10 to 20 percent of patients with uh, transverse myelitis will have an underlying, underlying rheumatic or autoimmune syndrome that they be exhaustively and comprehensively screened. And any TM patient who presents, number one, with a history of oral ulcers, it's important to consider the diagnosis of lupus, the Shett syndrome, as well as inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease. If you present or you have a history of a butterfly rash, consider the diagnosis of lupus. Again, if you have a history of dry eyes or dry mouth, consider the diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. And I really can't emphasize the following point enough, is that don't stop the diagnostic workup if the blood tests are negative, that you really need to have objective evidence either to rule in or rule out the diagnosis. If you have a history of arthritis, and by arthritis, not joint pain, but joint pain with swelling. So the arthritis is symmetric, meaning that it affects the right and left side equally, and it affects the larger joints, such as the elbows or the knees. Consider the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. If it's not symmetric and it affects the smaller joints, such as the knuckles or the fingers, consider the diagnosis either of lupus or Sjogren's syndrome. If there's a diagnosis of unexplained blood clots or strokes or heart attacks, um, consider the diagnosis of what we call antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And because of time restraints, I'm not going to get into this, but I wrote an article about this in the last newsletter, so please take a look at that if you're interested. And lastly, if there's a history of severe multi-organ disease, and by this I mean the transverse myelitis presents in the context of very severe lung disease and kidney disease. Um, consider the diagnosis of lupus, but also of vasculitis, which is another rheumatic disease where inflammation of blood vessels can affect any part of the uh, body. So in conclusion, I really want to emphasize that all patients with transverse myelitis really need rigorous and comprehensive screening to detect underlying rheumatic disease. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes it will precede the diagnosis of transverse myelitis. Sometimes it will come as much as decades afterwards. So it not only needs to be a static point at one point in time, but these need to be thought about longitudinally, often over decades in the lifetime of the patient. And again, I think this is the most important point from this presentation, that, that blood tests need to be confirmatory. But it really should never replace the primacy of considering pertinent, salient exam and history features, which might either point towards or against an underlying rheumatic disease. The neurological manifestations of lupus, including myelitis, are actually going to be due to syndromes other than lupus in up to three quarters of patients. And lastly, the neuropathy of Sjogren syndrome can be excruciatingly painful, and even in the absence of weakness, even in the absence of normal, even in the presence of normal nerve conduction studies, it's important to pursue this by skin biopsy and other diagnostic tests. Thank you.